Okay, <laughs> welcome to Running Stories Without Villains. We'll let the panelists introduce themselves, starting at the far end. Peter. My name is Peter Aurelian. Uh, I write epic fantasy for Tor. I've done a lot of uh, fiction that crosses over with music. Uh, I novelized um, a recent uh, concept album from the band Dream Theater, and am currently working on a new urban fantasy series that I'm collaborating with Brandon Sanderson on. My name is Joe Vasicek. I write fiction, mostly science fiction fantasy. Um, and my work's up on Amazon. I've got a lot of ebooks out, and uh, I keep a blog. My name is Suzanne Vincent, and I'm the editor in chief of Flash Fiction Online. Uh, I'm Christopher Husberg. I write dark epic fantasy novels. Uh, my series, The Chaos Queen Quintet, is uh, almost done. I'm. I'm uh, Doing the final pass on book four, that'll be out in June, and uh, last book comes out next year. And I'm Scott Parkin, your humble moderator. Uh, I'm irrelevant. We want to talk to these <laughs> folks. <laughs> so. I am really flattered, though, that when I said I'm, I'm the editor in chief of Flash Fiction Online Magazine, he said, Ooh, I, I feel really special. <laughs> I got a rejection Thank from you guys last week. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> was it a form rejection? It was. Okay. <laughs> so, to make sure that this panel is relevant to people, I want to see uh, does anyone here have some questions up front? Because what we'd like to do is spend the first half hour or so just chatting, but let's try to focus it. So does anyone have specific things they'd like us to talk about? Within? I do. If you have an empty seat next to you, raise your hand because we have people in the back there looking there for seats. Oh, yeah. Two. Okay, anyone else with questions? Or anyone with questions? Yeah. Um, so what if you have so many, uh, what do you do when you have so many villains that you don't really have any of them focused in on? So it <laughs> feels you like your story you? doesn't have a villain. I think, okay, so good like, question. So any other questions? I'm just getting just good questions. Yeah. Is there a exactly. link correlation to how many, to a story that would work better without a villain? Um, would a long, could you make a longer story, a novel without a villain as easily as you can make a shorter one without a villain? Okay. Yeah. Hi, Scott. Hi. <laughs> Back in the corner. Uh, yep. Yeah, how do you maintain dramatic tension in a story that doesn't have a villain? Okay, good. And here's some examples on like man versus nature, or like nature is the villain, or the conflict in the story. Okay, we'll get to that here in a minute. Okay, anything else? Let's go ahead and get started then. Um, yeah, can you write a, no a, a story without a villain? Yes. Anyone? <laughs> yes, yes. And to avoid the starting answer. So, so. And how? Our stories, the stories that I publish are a thousand words or less, right? In a thousand words or less, there isn't, you don't have enough space to develop a villain as well as a protagonist, so we don't have very many villains in the stories that we write. So if you want to find out how that's done, study flash fiction. Go to my magazine, Flash Fiction Online. Um, read everything there. Very, very few villains in these stories. But the length doesn't matter because how many of you have read the Stormlight Archive? <laughs> Raise your hand high if you've read the Stormlight Archive. <coughs> Identify the villain in those books. <laughs> Silence. Do you hear that? Silence. There is no clear villain in those books, and they're freaking long. <laughs> so what's the villain in those books? I um, I sat on a panel once with George Martin on this topic, and his um, his opening salvo was, "I don't believe in villains," and what he meant by that is that, and you've all heard this before, is that everybody's the hero of their own story. So it, it's an interesting, um, I don't know, dichotomy for me to think about what is the difference between a villain and an antagonist, because yeah. uh, often a villain, you'll you'll understand throughout the story less of their motivation. Um, they do things that are that are frustrating and diabolical and evil. Um, an antagonist, though, I like the term better because it's it's someone that works at odds with the hero of your story. I'm still one who I, who likes the idea that you know who to cheer for. I don't. I, this whole idea of moral ambiguity is something I'm glad to debate and. Um, 
uh, and I'm on the side of, of heroes, uh, which isn't to say perfect people. But this idea of the antagonist, which is somebody whose motivations and needs and goals are at odds with the person that is maybe the hero of your story, I think is really interesting. And it's why when you talk to people about Stormlight or Song of um, Ice and Fire, um, they, they all have sort of varying viewpoints on who they're cheering for and who they think the antagonist is, um, which I think is a very clear different, clearly, clearly different thing than um, the, the villain who is twirling their mustache. My favorite example of a, a book, a story without a villain, uh, would probably be The Killer Angels by... Uh, sure, I know that is. But Killer Angels, if you're not familiar, it's a historical novel. It's about the Battle of Gettysburg. It's what the, uh, the movie ba Gettysburg is based off of. And it's the American Civil War. There's a lot of conflict. A lot of conflict. But Robert E. Lee is one of the main characters. And then you've got Hancock and Chamberlain who are on the, on the other side. And like we were saying about um, like moral ambiguity, there's not a whole, I mean, there's not really a whole lot of moral ambiguity either. There's, you know... It's not saying, well, is slavery really that wrong? It's no, the, the, the book's not about that at all. But it's there's a lot of conflict, um, but it's tragic because it's it's an American story, and there's the two sides are both American, and they're both going up with each other. Um, and the really neat thing is that uh, Michael Shera, his son, um, ended up writing the prequel, Gods and Generals, and then the sequel, The Last Full Measure, which is like everything in the Civil War leading up to the Battle of Gettysburg, and then everything in the Civil War leading to um, signing the uh, yeah to, to the, the to the final surrender. So to get to your question before about length, can you write a can you write a long story without a villain? Yes, you can, and you can do it very well, and it can still have a lot of conflict. I think, just to tag along with what Peter is saying, uh, I absolutely think it's important to distinguish between a villain and an antagonist. Um, and and not just an antagonist, but antagonizing forces, right? Because if you get into stories like Man vs. Nature, you don't have a single person or even a group that your character is up against. It could be its nature, or it could be him. It, it could be a number of things, right? It could also be his own mind, or his or her own mind. Um, and so there may just be forces, right, uh, that are that act against him, that put things in his way, um, and and that's that's as much of a story as anything, right? I, I think it's a different question uh, if you want to ask, is it possible to write a story without an antagonist or antagonizing forces? Um, my gut answer is to say no, because if there was an anti weren't antagonizing forces, I'm not sure that's a story. You can you can write words on a page that describe something that happened without antagonizing forces, but I don't know if that's a story. It's oh, called literary it's, fiction. It's called. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 we do not publish stories that don't have complete resolved plots, okay? So we publish a fair amount of literary fiction that has complete resolved plots. They're not generally as strong a plot, but they are still there. Otherwise, we wouldn't publish them. So, but in literary fiction, that's called vignette, okay? Vignette or stream of consciousness. So those are not stories. They're not stories. They're just pretty prose, but they're not stories. A story has... Uh, characters, a story has a conflict, and a story resolves that conflict. So, um, so a lot of times, your your villain or your antagonist might simply be the conflict. It might simply be the problem that your character has to resolve, has to figure out. Sometimes you also have overlapping stories, like in the Killer Angels, you have. The story of Chamberlain, you have the story of Robert E. Lee, you have the story of um, Armistead, you have the story of uh, Hancock. And the thing is, they're all kind of cross purposes to each other in some ways. But so if you were to draw one, like if you were to draw the story of Robert E. Lee, then the antagonist would be everyone on the Union side. But if you draw Chamberlain, then you have, you know, you have Longstreet, and you have everybody, you know, on the on the Confederate side. But the thing is, it's it's interwoven. And the story, it's multiple stories that are interwoven where they're all either sometimes they're the protagonist, sometimes they're the antagonist. So, yeah. Well, and I think it's interesting, you know, Joe, you bring up a historical novel, and, and uh, you know, Peter, you mentioned this quote by George R. R. Martin that, or not a quote, but he often says, right, that every 
villain is the hero of his own story. Um, and, and that's, if we look at human nature, right, every single one of us, that's just how we operate. That's how things have always gone. Um, and there aren't, I mean, there aren't villains, right? Uh, in, in human, I mean, you can make the argument in a few cases, I guess, but, but I think they would, you know, those people more often than not think that they are doing, if not the right thing, something that is good, at least for them, right? They have their own motivation that drives them. Um, and that's and, more true now than it has been in the past. I think that's true, yeah. Oh, and, and just a brief comment, I think an awful, I think more stories don't have a specific singular villain. Uh, it's been argued, for example, that there are really only three basic story types. I know, or 20 or 84 or whatever. <laughs> but there's, you know, man against man, which is a specific antagonist or a villain. Man against nature and man against self slash God. Two of those don't have on-screen villains, but they do have tremendous antagonism. I think that's a, a kind of a key thing. So talking, you know, let's go ahead and shift the, the title of the panel to writing a story without villains, how to make interesting non-personal antagonists. <laughs> when you say non-personal, like not character? Uh, not a character, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, because arguably, right, Dune, the planet is a character, as well as all these <laughs> other things. Sure. The Martian Mars is a character. Uh, it's a source. It's a it's a great question, um, an esoteric question. Uh, before we get to it, if I can, I'd like to say one thing about the personal villain. Um, I think one of the things that's really important is if it's true, and I think it's true that that everybody's the hero of their own story. Like as uncomfortable as it will to hear be to hear, even Hitler um, felt like he had proper motivation. And so it, it leads you to this idea that what is ch what you can challenge your reader with is um, the motivations of the character. And then you can align you know, their sort of reader interest against those. When you hear about the Confederate story, depending on who's reading that and what part of the country, you probably get a different idea about who the hero is, right? Oh, you mean the war of Northern aggression? Yeah, yeah. And and that's a that's an interesting example. But writing that no novel today, um, probably the motivation of the person who's trying to defend, defend, defend slavery um, most people align behind the motivations of, the, of those who want to eradicate that, right? So then um, you can draw a character who feels compelled and motivated and righteous in their endeavor for their motivation, but you can still, it can still be pretty apparent for the reader who, which, what, which of the people it is to cheer for. And the reason I think this is important is because at the end of the day, when you have your comeuppance at the end, it, it's more edifying, it's more satisfying for the reader if, unless you're, unless you're writing a horror novel like The Monk. Has anybody read The Monk? One person. Okay, that's, you all need to read The Monk because it's one of those novels that um, does the exact opposite of this and it's so dark and so unsatisfying at the end and so irredeemable that um, you kind of feel like a worse person when you when you finish reading it. And that's maybe not the reading experience you want. Um, and the reason I say that is because if you're, if you're, not that everything's about commercial success, but if you want readership, most people want, having gone through a journey and followed your characters, they want to have had those trials and those challenges and some defeats. But when they have that victory, they've, they've, they've co-created with you this story. And that's why it can be so satisfying. So you want them aligned behind, I think, this is my bias, but I think you want them aligned behind uh, motivations that we kind, of, uh, we kind of agree on. And this is a genre thing. I think most genre does this pretty well. This is why I made my, my glib comment about literary fiction. There are all kinds of categories of fiction that have different conventions and they're viable, but I'm guessing most of you in this room are, are writing genre. So that's why I stilt the advice that way. You know, every every character, every person is the hero of their own story, but every hero exists inside of a context, inside of a cultural context, and every culture has its own origin myth. And an origin myth establishes three things. It establishes um, it establishes first of all the origins of that culture, that civilization, kind of how we got started, the origin story. 
It, is that it defines right and wrong within the context, the cultural context, and it defines what is sacred. <laughs> and we can see this on American coinage, the, the traditional American origin myth, because there are three things that are on every piece of American coinage. Those three things are e pluribus unum, in God we trust, and liberty. So e pluribus unum, we were founded in the Revolutionary War. E pluribus unum, one out of many. It was the slogan of the, of the Revolutionary War. In God we trust. We believe in um, our founding documents, our founding fathers, the, the philosophy was built on Judeo-Christian. And this is a traditional, this is a traditional American thing. There's a lot of conflict and discussion about like what, you know, what is relevant and what's not. But this is the traditional version. And liberty, which is what we as Americans hold sacred. Your origin myth is going to define what your hero considers to be evil, what considers to be villainous, and what's not. Ever since World War II, uh, in the West, our origin myth has changed a little bit, where now um, World War II was such a traumatic event that that's considered like the origin of our modern society. The, the UN, everything, the, the political organizations, geopolitics and everything, banking was all kind of born out of World War II. Um, the Nazis kind of defined what is evil. So now instead of from good to evil, and the Nazis are on the scale, which zero to Nazi, and you know, that's kind of the scale now, which, and then you have the Holocaust, which is considered what is, we hold it sacred, but it's also kind of this horrible thing, and then it, it gets into all kinds of other things from that. And then, um, so that defines why, like, why everyone's calling everybody Nazis, because, well, that's how we define what evil is nowadays. Um, so understanding what the context is that your hero lives in will help to understand who is the villain um, and, and how, they, how, they, how they see who is the villain, basically. Oh, I, I, I just had the thought that um, history is written by the winners, right? So you get to decide who the winner is in, in the history of your, your book or story, whatever it is. Well, and how's that going to shape? Here is written by the winners, Villain. but Pravda Vityazi, truth prevails. Idealistic. <laughs> right. It's a Czech thing. I'm a Czech, so there okay. you go. <laughs> this one. Um, well, kind of going down that path a little bit. So um, the, the idea, because we've talked about, right, uh, uh, against nature type stories, which is certainly kind of self-explanatory, right? They're survival. They're how do I get... Uh, how do I continue until the end of the book? It's not personal, it just is. So problems to be solved, etc. But taking that other idea, uh, the idea of the antagonist, who may or may not be evil, according to Joe's taxonomy, uh, and a, a protagonist who may or may not be good, according to Joe's taxonomy, the uh, unreliable narrator. Is this uh, another way we can go, or what do you think of that? I hate unreliable narrators. <laughs> you know, unless, unless you're characterizing a character as unreliable, that's fine. But to make your narrator unreliable, it messes with your with your readers' heads. And then it's really hard to manipulate the point at which you reveal what the truth is without your reader going, "What?" I mean. Um, so I'm, I don't like unreliable narrators, and and that's one thing that I will edit right out of stories before I publish them. Is you know I I need to know what the truth is. I need to know what the truth is. You can have a character that lies, but I I would like to. So we have a story that I'm working on with an author. It's called The Liar's Son. Okay, and I'm I'm really trying to figure out how to do this well. But this woman is telling her little girl that, that the liar's son come, comes once a year and it, me, and it makes everybody tell lies. Okay, so, so don't listen to anybody. We're going to put wax in our ears. We're not going to go out on that day because everybody that we talk to is going to tell lies. Okay? And horrible lies. People are going to say horrible, terrible things. So come to find out by the end of the story that it's actually not the liar's son. It's the truth son. And it's the truth that the mother is afraid of. So here we have this woman who is, and, and at some point, I mean, the, 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 the narrator has to be somewhat unreliable because the narrator can't reveal that truth to us at the beginning. Otherwise, it would completely ruin the story because the whole plot twist at the end of the story is that, you know, and so I, I had to have, make sure that she did not put in things that were, gonna, that were going to keep me too much in the dark 
or that she put in clues so that when I got to that conclusion at the end, I went, oh my gosh, yes, that's what it is. But I did have to work with her on that a little bit. But the, but the narrator, the narrator had to be reliable, even though the mother was not. Even though the, the, the whole situation started with this complete lie. You know, I needed to be able to logically get to the truth at the end, so. Well, who would be the villain in that? The villain is is the situation. I mean, in 99% in of flash fiction, that's going to be the case, the villain. And I'm going to argue that in the Stormlight Archives, that it's the situation that's the villain. This, the, the Everstorm and the... And what's coming, all you know, the prophecies, it's the situation, it's the conflict itself, it's the villain in those stories. So um, so ninety-nine percent of the time it's gonna be it's gonna be the, the situation. What's wrong? What's happened? What's wrong that needs to be fixed? You know? So, so how do we how do we infuse this story that has no personified necessarily antagonist? Uh, how do we maintain tension? How do we how do we draw the reader through the conflicts that you set up? How many of you that have read Stormlight care about Kaladin? Okay, empathy. That empathy is the thing that keeps you caring and keeps you reading. You want to know what happens next to him? Well, and, and Kaladin faces a lot of antagonists, right? I mean, there's a lot of things in his way. And not just, the, not just people, but the situations. Sure, and... yeah. I, I, th I think, um, sorry, what was your question? I was going to say something, and then I was thinking of Kaladin. How do you <laughs> tension. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Shouldn't draw. Um, tension, so, so uh, a lot of tension in, you know, when it comes to writing, doesn't necessarily have to do with the conflict between a person and a person, or even a person and a thing, but rather a person and, you know, our, our protagonist and, you know, our protagonist takes an action, and he or she, uh, and there are consequences of that action, and he or she has expectations of what will happen after that action. And conflict and tension often comes from their expectations being wildly different from what actually happens, right? And you don't need an antagonizing force for that to happen. It often helps, right? You can have an antagonist manipulating the reaction um, and changing things and, and disrupting things for the protagonist. But but life, right? Like often, I have an expectation of what will happen. You know, if I uh, write a book and send it to an agent, I think I think it's going to get published, right? And lo and behold, they send me a form rejection, and I'm back at square one. What am I going to do, right? That's a huge gap between what actually happened and my expectation of what happened. And there's conflict there, right? What am I gonna do now? Am I gonna send this out to more people if it was rejected so you know, clearly from this person or am I gonna write another novel? Like, there's, there's tension in a story. You don't have to have a person causing it. Um, often it is situational, it's life that makes these things for us. Um, but but it's, it's a question of uh, what do you want your story to accomplish? You know, how, what, what kind of story do you wanna tell? And that will hopefully direct you towards how to, how to you know, magnify that conflict. A, a novel will, if it's successful, will do all of these things. Um, short form, you know, you've got to focus. If you're writing a, a, t a traditional short story that's three to six thousand words, usually you're going to have, you know, one resistant force, whether it's uh, unembodied, whether it's uh, personable or, or a personage or whether it's the the um, character themselves you know and a lot of times these come in the form of people who are who are um, have mental instabilities or they're fighting against some sort of um, fracture in, in their own psyche or or a, a an unintended consequence from something that they've done but a novel like a good novel is is rich with the opportunity for you to have um, embodied antagonists who are working directly in opposition to the goal that your character has. It'll have, um, for, this is why fantasy is rich also with the fact that you've got a, often a, a second world setting, or even if it's, if it's in our world, you have um, a setting that's fantastical, and so you can have things that are, that are challenging your character that, that are not coming in the body of a person. The thing that, that occurred to me while the panelists were talking is um, when you kind of get into the motivations of a character and they are at odds with, you know, 
those that you're writing that you hope that your your readers are following as your champions. And, and hopefully your champions have flaws and we see those and those flaws are part of the reasons that they're not always succeeding every time they're trying to accomplish something. The same needs to be true of your antagonist. Um, the, I thought about this, I can't, there was a comment that was made and, and I wrote this scene in one of my fantasy novels where one of the clear antagonists um, who most of the time is seen doing something really, really kind of awful um, and hurting people and duplicitous and all of that. There's a scene that I, I deliberately uh, have in the novel that he's talking to a young boy and you see a tenderness in him that you you don't you've never seen. And he it, it seems uncharacteristic, but what, what you come to find out is that this particular antagonist had a very, very challenged childhood. Like um, extreme poverty. Um, I, I won't go into all of the, the negatives, but it as a consequence of that, he has this particular desire to safeguard the well-being of children. And so you see this about him and all of the sudden he becomes much more complex and you start to see while I don't agree with his motivations um, I understand them and I think understanding is a really good complex complexifier if that's even a word for, for it is now I trademarked that um, <laughs> for your for your characters and so in the same way that you hear all the time with your your heroes make sure they have flaws um, and that makes them believable and, and have them fail that's all true, but with your antagonist, do some things where they do these gestures of humanity. And in, as you see those things, now all of a sudden, they're, they're real people. You don't have to agree with their motivations or their goals, but um, all of a sudden, they're, they're multidimensional. And I think that that's, that's really valuable for your writing. For me, that's not moral ambiguity, um, but it just cre it creates dimension to the character, to the antagonist. Um, that, that makes the, and that this is precisely, I think, the, the genius of what Martin did with his characters. Speaking of flaws, I think that the flaw can be your antagonist. Something within your character that, that they have a hard time getting over. I, you know, I thought of the, of the movie Wonder. It's, it's that boy's physical flaw that's the antagonist that he has to, he has to overcome his feelings about about it. He has to overcome his, the way he deals with that. Well, that's a good example because that has multiple antagonists. There are boys oh, that most stories do that are bullying him, right? And and then there's this beautiful beautiful moment in that story. That, uh, do you all know the Wonder Story? Yes. Where where there's a change of heart, right? Um, now that's a that's not a genre piece because most of your antagonists in genre are not going to have a change of heart and do kumbaya with your hero. <laughs> I think I, uh, another example of that, it's been a while since I've seen this, but uh, American History X, uh, Edward Norton's character is a, is a white supremacist who basically uh, comes to learn that what he's doing maybe isn't right. And that's, that's, that's the plot. And there, there are antagonistic forces and antagonists in that film, but I, I think you can make an argument that, that the main antagonist there is, his, is this flaw, that he is um, violently racist. Breaking Bad, Walter White. Oh, yeah. Everything that you know bad, you know that happens to him is pretty much his fault. And that's um, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah. Well, that's that's an interesting example because I think that's an example of where he becomes the flaw ultimately, right? Where, yes. where it's where it's the flaw of the antagonist, and he becomes the flaw, and and becomes the antagonist of the series. But he becomes way. the hero by taking himself out, basically. Mm -hmm. but, you know. Also, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a, that's a oh, very. You it for yeah. That's a very, I think that's a very polarizing story because when I finally watched Breaking Bad, um, I didn't find a single character redeemable. So at the end, I'd have been fine if everybody died. Not even, not even the sun? With the, the, su the sun, the sun is the one, you're right, you're right, that's fair. The, the sun is the one good character in that, I think, in my opinion, of that entire show. But, you know, all of those other characters, even those that got away, they were not deserving of any freedom or congratulations. Like, they were all reprobates, all of them. But the interesting thing about, about that, that I, for me was, 
the, the main character, while he does some deplorable things, and you watch, just like Heart of Darkness uh, from Joseph Conrad, you watch his progression and his willingness to do evil. He started, and even towards the end, when he goes back to see his wife, he started with this idea of doing it for my family. And the only reason I finished that series was to find out if he, if he accomplished that one task. Um, so, I mean, it's a case study in, in a lot of ways, but it's a polarizing story because uh, a lot of people love it, but I think those people are a bunch of reprobates. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, like, like Wicked. How many of you have read Wicked? Did you like it? No. Who, okay, who, who has read Wicked and loved it? Who has read Wicked and hated it? Oh, wow, you are in a vast minority. <laughs> terrible, terrible. I carry them out. There wasn't a single. They were, they were just. They were just all antagonists. I couldn't root for a single character. I have one like that. Who who has seen the the Broadway show Hamilton? Who loved it? Who didn't love it? Okay, <laughs> I'm with you guys. And the only thing I'll say about that is the 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 character they based that entire thing on. If, if accurate, and I'm not a historian without, with, with, uh, with Hamilton, but is, is a reprobate, a complete narcissist. Mm -hmm. The only redeeming character in that story was his wife. That's who the musical should have been about. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do you one better. Who's read The Hunger Games? <laughs> who likes Katniss? <laughs> who hated Katniss? <laughs> Actually, well, there's a lot of people. Yeah, wow, I'm surprised. Like who was yeah, really yeah. 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 <laughs> anyways, anyways, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> so, kind of following along this idea, uh, where we have a villain or a, a, a strong antagonist, and partway through the story, we, the character develops, realizes that, oh, I've been pursuing the wrong solution or the wrong uh, antagonist. This also feels like a, a, an interesting way of approaching it, right? The, the so-called Hollywood reversal. It's like a Greek tragedy. It's like Oedipus. You know? Without the machine, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, we've hit that point at about uh, 20 minutes left. Are there any questions from the audience or any but things you'd like to refine here? We have here? an answer, oh, yeah. too. Oh, you had some questions so, up front that you said. So, do, do you think we well, for everybody helped you? Huh? Would you like a little bit more help in how to handle multiple antagonists? Mm. You know, like, how do I have several villains, right? But how do I make... Um, I either want to know whether to pick one of them to make the, the you know the big one that I focus on and make complex and make interesting and all that, or to just have all of them be okay, but um, just to the point where I don't have a clear villain. Have you heard the term defeat in detail? It's how Napoleon conquered Europe. Instead of facing like the French, if all if everyone was united against them and if they, all the armies had combined in one, it would have been very difficult for him to defeat them. But what he basically did, except for, I think, the Battle of Austerlitz, he uh, basically made it so they had to all split up to defend multiple points, and then he defeated them one at a time. One thing you could do is have, you know, one chapter be the focus of one villain, and then the next chapter be the focus, like, the, the other, the next one is the next villain. Kind of like a video game where you have, like, final, like, bosses at the end of each level. Yeah, just go villain by villain. Also, don't walk away from here thinking that we're saying that writing stories with with clear villains is bad, okay? No, it, it's still great. Yeah. Villains these days are more complex than they were 30, 40, 50 years ago. But, you know, you know go with it. But, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking in two approaches. One is you've got all these villains, but one of them is the head, or they're part of a larger organization and it's the organization that's the villain. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm trying okay. to say. David Weber, Honor Harrington. What? David Weber, Honor Harrington. There's a lot of that. Okay. Because that was a question I was going to ask you, is, is why multiple villains? But the answer is because they're all stooges with the organization, and that's a different type of story. Got a question over here? Yeah, so in the, in, this is actually referring to the description of this panel, is that not just how do you have a non-player, a non-person villain, but how do you, antagonist, but how do you make their defeat satisfying? Because if it's a person, you can throw them off of a building and everybody cheers. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If it's not a person, how do you make that climax actually climactic instead of mm -hmm. just 
they wear them and it goes away. Right. So there, there's a few, I mean, um, you can make the argument that some monster movies are sort of man versus nature, right? And, and you can still, like Jaws, you can still slay, you know, the, the dragon as it were. Um, but really, when we're talking, I mean, someone here mentioned survival, right? And that's really the key. That, that's how a protagonist, more often than not, is victorious in a novel, where there's not a clear, you, you know, there's not a human uh, antagonist. There's just antagonizing forces, whether it's nature or some other entity, but, you know, alien, um, any disaster movie, right? Uh, the survival is the goal, um, so that might be something to think about. Um, so it come, kind of a, right. kind of still comes to a peak. An escalation, oh, sure. right? Oh yeah, right. you, you want an escalation mm -hmm. of yeah. danger yeah. and like, uh, yeah, yeah. It, okay. It's going to resolve when your character solves his problem, no matter what that is. Okay, and sometimes that resolution is not satisfactory. Sometimes that resolution is not that he wins. Sometimes it's that he loses. Um, but sometimes it's just, it's conquering the situation ahead. The, the glass castle, is that what it's called? Um, about the woman who was raised by homeless people, essentially, oh. and yeah. is that it was called, yeah. the glass yeah. castle? Okay, yeah. so, you know, her conquest was getting out of that. Her conquest was becoming a productive member of society, you know? And yet, still maintaining a connection with her family, still, still having that connection with her parents, but coming to a point where she goes, "This is not normal. This is weird, and this is wrong. And I, I have to take the reins of my life and become what my parents are not." And, she, and, and the process, and in the process of the book, she does that. She accomplishes that. Oftentimes, the victory is really just a restoration of balance. And so what that means is it could be that there's uh, an embodied evil or an embodied antagonist and its defeat signals a restoration of balance. But it, the same is true of, of, you know, someone who's lost in the woods. And you've seen a lot of these films in the last several years when they finally make it back to civilization and things return to the way they were. That the victory is the restoration of balance. Same could be said of someone who's suffering from mental illness or, or some sort of you know personal, um, you know. And this is where mainstream fiction does most of its work. It's not antagonists in that same sort of way, but it's something that has upset their life, frustrated their life in a way. And the 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 victory in those kinds of novels is the return to life the way it was before the inciting incident. Although that balance sometimes is not the way it was before, but it's a new kind of balance. Right. I was thinking of Castaway. That's what I was just going to say. Oh, yeah. was, Tom Hanks makes a history of playing characters who are rescued, but not necessarily happy about it in the end. Yeah. Well, and there's a difference between, I mean, a character ha has to progress. Um, there has to be some sort of change. So the balance, more often than not, at the end, is going to be different, at least in some way, on some level, than a, the balance in the beginning. Um, but it's going to reflect that balance from the beginning, and it is going to be a balance, right? It's going to be so, a, an equilibrium where the characters can now kind of live, um, live their lives without any really crazy interruptions. It's the the thing I would I agree with that. I think what I would say is the characters aren't the same because they they wear new wounds uh, and all of that. They're changed. But the, what's cool about the castaway as an example is in in his life before he had choice. He was able to go about and make choices. He had a job, he had a relationship, he had all those things. And all of those things were removed from him. Um, and he had, to, he had to figure out how to live in this isolated situation and survive. The very ending of that movie is him coming to a crossroads. And for me, what the, the metaphor there is, I have new choices. And I, I have a restoration of my ability to, to choose, and I can take a path, and I can walk that path. I no longer am circumscribed to this, this island that forecloses all my opportunity. So, but he's a changed person now. So, that's what that's what I meant. Discovery new possibilities. Okay. Mm -hmm. Were there other questions? Yeah. Any thoughts about why a move to having uh, more complex villains and, and more stories that it's not clear who's the villain and who's not? 
Why? Because it's better. Because <laughs> it's better. Oh, yeah, I agree, but, but See, I, de- I, don't, I don't agree with that. Don't you? I, I, and there's different kinds of readers, and so you have to decide which, which kind of book you want to write. I, for me, it's I want my villains to have moments where you see that they're not one-dimensional. I don't want snidely whiplash, and I don't want my heroes to be um, Sir Galahad, like without problems and flaws. 100% true on all of that. But I, I've, I've grown so weary of what a lot of fic- the fiction circles call this moral ambiguity where you, you don't know who to root for. Right. Um, I, that I, I, won't, I won't read those stories. Life's too short to read about dreariness. <laughs> and so, so you should, you, I, my opinion, this is my bias, work hard that your characters are not, are not paper cutouts, right? They're not cliches. Um, but I think it's absolutely okay for you to make it clear for the reader who the hero is and who, who they're fighting against and why. Um, I, I think those kinds of stories are more edifying for people to read. Now, having said that, there's a lot of people who love grimdark fiction and it has an audience. But it, it's, it's grim. That's why it takes the name. And and I... Anyway, I'll get up. End, Ender's Game, there's a thing where kind of a theme throughout it is that like in order to defeat like you know Sun Tzu you know if you want to defeat your enemy you need to know yourself and know your enemy but to really have the ultimate victory you need to know your enemy so well that you can't help but love your enemy I think there's a degree of that um, and writing a more complex story where maybe not without the with the moral ambiguity but more where it's like there's they're not necessarily villains but they're they're cross competing they're fighting each other and, and like, like, like the killer angels um you come to love both sides, and it feels more like like the Killer Angels. Angels is a tragedy because the Civil War was a tragedy for both sides. It was you know there's this moment at the end where there's two generals. There's Armistead and Hancock. So Armistead's for the South. Hancock is for the North. They were good friends. They were in the in the class together, um, West Point, and then they went off to both sides. And then they found themselves in opposite sides of the battle. Both of them were shot. Both of them, like Armistead, gets shot at the at the high water point of the of the Confederacy. And and he's as he's lying there dying, he asks, you know, I'd like to see my friend Hancock. And the soldier says, I'm sorry, Hancock's been down. And he says, No, not both of us, not all of us. So it, it depends on the kind of story you're writing. Right. So I'm having this moment of enlightenment, I think. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna throw this out there because I haven't quite gotten it figured out in my brain yet. But I think that the answer to your question <coughs> is is the age of of um, I lost the term. Okay. We we are in it, the information age. I think the information age has broadened what we know so much and broadened our understanding of things and people so much that we're no longer really able to look at somebody and go, you're bad or you're good. We want to know more about them because we have so much information, we want to know more about everything. And and at the risk of being a nihilistic troll, (laughs) (laughs) he's the villain. Yeah. Sometimes we tell stories to allow ourselves to feel better about the non-moral choices we make. Uh, um, bad. By softening the villains to the point of non-villainy and somehow, end up, speaking of Breaking Bad, um, right? Uh, and that's, I think that's a little bit of the social phenomenon we're living through right now that leads to some of those stories. So our time is nearly done. What I'd like to do is give the panelists uh, uh, just a closing statement. Uh, whoever wants to speak most, speak first. Uh, I'll just say, uh, I, I think I, I think there's room for all the stories still. You know what I mean? Like, I think yeah. absolutely people want to read stories where there is a clear villain and a clear protagonist and they duke it out and the hero wins and it's this epic thing, right? I think there are also people that want to read the stories where they're both complicated and maybe one makes good or bad choices or whatever and and everything in between, right? So I think the question you should ask yourself is what kind of story do I want to write? And then to go for that, right? Um, I, I think that's... I, I think personally that that's that's what that's what I do and I, I and I like what I write so I think um, it works out for me so give it a try. Um, I'm going to give one more push for empathy. I think it is so so central to writing 
um, successful characters and writing stories that you care about and understanding the, the difference between empathy and sympathy because you should not be writing sympathy you don't want your readers to, you don't want to be making your readers sympathize with your character sympathy will come naturally if they empathize with your character okay um, and I'm over in Birch at my next panel, Point of View, What's the Big Deal? And if anybody wants a business card, write here. They're right there. Write flash fiction, it's so good for you. <laughs> Don't feel like you have to write with a villain. Don't feel like you have to write without a villain. And subscribe to PewDiePie. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the answer I would have given to this years ago is different than the answer I give today. So just that's my uh, caveat. The older I get, um, the more I think it's important that the stories we write edify. Um, because there's this, there's this thing that my favorite writer, his name is Dan Simmons, says. He says, a good teacher will touch eternity, and so will a bad one. And in that same spirit, if you go out and write about someone who is so morally ambigu ambiguous, and, and cause us to empathize with somebody who does evil things, I'm not sure you're leaving the right kind of legacy for readers and humanity. Well, nothing can top that. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.